Hi brothers and sisters, Jerry O'Donnell here for Angel's Messages and here with uh, an interesting study, at least I was impressed that it would be interesting and it was a paragraph that I read from Ellen White that basically creates the title called What is the State of Our World? and I'm going to do an overview today and then I'm going to follow up with the details over the next few Sabbaths and so get ready for some PowerPoint presentations at that time but uh, I'll read the paragraph to you hopefully you'll be impressed to say hey that sounds interesting I'm going to give you an overview by going over all the verses that Ellen White provides for us and and then that'll be today's message then we'll go back and fill in the details because as I read all the scriptures there was a lot to it I thought it was just a list of things there'll be earthquakes and floods and and pestilences in the last days no it's not like that it's a lot more detailed and I think it behooves us to get a full glimpse of what we're going to look at and then go back and get those details and so with that in mind let's get started by st starting off with prayer our father thank you so very much for this opportunity to spend in thy word I pray that you will enlighten us by thy Holy Spirit to the things that are so transform us into the people that we ought to be and I ask personally that you use me as your instrument uh, to speak the words you would have spoken and impress upon me that which ought to be commented upon and draw attention to and may all of us be receptive in our hearts to receive thy word and instruction in Jesus name we pray these things amen okay so as I stated <clears throat> uh, the title of this message happens to be what is the state of the world and of course we're interested in the state of the world at or near the second coming uh, which I believe that we are basically living in and so in my daily reading time that I have uh, for those that are not aware of, of that I'm rereading all of Ellen White's writings from the very beginning and I'm taking two pathways one is all her books and compilations and articles she wrote and that's one pathway that I uh, uh, happen to get through and up up to the letter P because I'm in patriarchs and prophets the other pathway is what was held at the white estates and just a decade or so ago was released to the general public and that's all the letters and manuscripts and each day side by side I'm reading a portion from each and I have gotten now recently to the year 1994 in her letters and manuscripts and why that's significant is because I'm not a full one-third of the way through all her letters and manuscripts and I'm in the year 19, uh, 1894 I'm sorry 1894 uh, correction there if I said 1994 my apologies 1894 oh and it includes her diary entries as well and the reason I am doing this is to get a sense of what it really was uh, in the true Seventh-day Adventist because I am hearing a whole lot of pressure from both inside and outside of the church in which I appear to be too much uh, of a stickler to the exact Word of God for instance and that's from th those that want to just play church inside the church and then I get the pressure outside the church that keeps saying look at all the pioneers they didn't believe in this that or the other thing that today's ch conference churches uh, are taught and they're in such error you might as well just call them Babylon and I'm not going that direction either I'm kind of caught in be between them th those two groups you got those that just want to play church that don't want to hear a thus saith the Lord and conform to a thus saith the Lord and they just want to you know label themselves hey I have the name I'm going to heaven type thing once saved always saved that I believe has crept into the church 
on the other side, like I said, uh, people are going way too far, and I would like to make the statement that no doctrine whatsoever should be established wholly on what pioneers um, happen to write, uh, have said, uh, and even gotten Ellen White's endorsement on certain things. For instance, um, uh, the, the writings of uh, Wagner uh, is an example of that. Um, uh, Jones and Wagner, more specifically, she endorsed them, and then later she, uh, they are writing things that are abhorrent. And just because they received an early endorsement does not mean that everything that they write is true. So how I treat things that, hey, the early pioneers disagreed on these things and it seems the vast majority of them came down on this particular side. All right, if it's that important, where is it in Ellen White's writings? I mean, for instance, how many Seventh-day Adventists are so much into this revelation that Turkey is going to come down through Israel and basically make war with Egypt physically? And like, there's another Middle East war coming. And uh, they spend so much energy over there. If Turkey is that important, where is it in the scriptures? Oh, wait a sec. She endorsed uh, uh, one of those earlier pioneers in the book of Dan the, uh, Daniel and the Revelation. Uh, she says, you know, that it will always last until the end of time. That's a clear dis distinction there. And in his writings, he has placed in there about Turkey. Okay, he got an uh, endorsement from Ellen White, so-called, uh, uh, I shouldn't say so-called, I believe she is the prophet, but that doesn't make every aspect correct. Just like she endorsed the 1843 chart, but never stated that all the things that are on that chart are absolutely correct. In fact, later she states that there were a couple figures that were wrong. And that points to the 2520 group. See, Ellen White endorses the 1843, and right there is on the on the chart. But she says that there are figures that ought not to be there. Obviously, one of them is 1843 and not 1844. So correct that, 1844. But she said figures. Uh, what's the other figures that shouldn't be there or should be adjusted? And I believe it's the 2520 because all the other figures are accurate. And if it's just 1843, she would have stated that. She says, well, there's, uh, you know, the ending date was wrong. It should be 1844. She would have said that. But no, she does not say that. She says figures as if there's more than one uh, date on there that is incorrect. And so that's my position on the 1843 chart. Uh, you know, how many times am I inundated by people that say, uh, anybody that believes in a, a three-person Godhead is actually accepting the Trinity of the Catholic Church and, and how far off they happen to be because, like I said, I'm up to 1894 in her writings. That means over two-thirds of the material, because I'm not even a third of the way through, I have some type of calculation that I do. That means that when they say, ignore those writings that are after 1888, they're throwing out the vast majority of what Ellen White has said, and that is where she comes down firmly on the side that there is a three-person Godhead, and that the Holy Spirit is a person as much as the Father is a person. And all these aspects that work itself out if we actually take the time to read all the writings. So the next time someone jumps on board of, well, the early pioneers, the, and she says we're supposed to be pulling information in, and like in my own publication, the Four Angels Messages, we have an article dedicated, written by one of the early pioneers, but I tell you this much, for an article from the pioneer to actually appear there, I have to read through several of them before I come across one that I say, yes, this is acceptable to place in. Because I have read enough of Ellen White and have read it in the past, uh, all her writings, and uh, I recall those things, and I compare 
does that stance that the pioneers take, and some of them being famous pioneers, even James White himself, does it stand the, the test of Ellen White's writings and the scriptures as well? And the answer is no, and that's why they don't get uh, easily just published in the in the publication that I have. But uh, where I'm going with that is that that is the test, especially when Ellen White writes entries into her own diary. Uh, for those that have this conspiracy theory of that uh, the White estates have gone in and made adjustments and have twisted her words and, and, and changed things, uh, the one thing is, yes, some of the uh, comp uh, compilations are human-handed made, and there are challenges with those, but that doesn't forbid you from reading them. It just, before you go screaming with the, with the doctrine on it, go to the full context of where it was pulled from and read the whole chapter and find out that one little paragraph means really what it means. All these things that you bring it to real prophetic content. So I do not want to hear all the evidence that just the pioneers have. I'm sorry if it's that important and a salvation issue, you need to then show me in Ellen White's writings and fully understood through the scriptures that it is so. So with that in mind, I came across in uh, just recently at the conclusion of the 1893 year in what is referred to as Manuscript 110. And I found this, instead of just reading it's a letter to this or it's a, a part of a sermon to that, this one woke me up out of that just formal reading thereof. You know, you can read the Patriarchs and Prophets book and it's like you, you kind of get in that law of, okay, this is what happened next. Yeah, I remember that from the Bible. Now she's expanding upon the details thereof. And it's almost like a good story to, to you. But then there's a paragraph that jumps out at you and say, like, well, wait a second. What did she just write? And that's what happened in the manuscript 110. It really got my attention so much so that I've decided to make this, well, a sermon. And here you go. So, Bear with me, because I don't have it up on a screen. I'm going to read it to you. Um, manuscript 110, parag uh, in the year 1893. She wrote this. The end of all things is at hand. Iniquity abounds, because men have transgressed the law and broken the everlasting covenant, given on condition of obedience. Pause. So, why do we keep the Ten Commandments? It's a condition to be able to receive the salvation, but yet the human race, especially the Christian community, have transgressed the law, nailed it to the cross, have nothing to do with the Ten Commandments whatsoever as part of salvation. They just think that Jesus died and everybody's going to heaven. It's universalism, basically. And because of a continual trans transgression as well, and that's the mess that we are in, you can blame the, the Christian churches of why we are in such immoral uh, situation that we happen to be. Why an adulterer can uh, easily, without guilt, attend church and, and feel like they're going to be saved. Then she rattles off a whole bunch of uh, verses out of the Bible. The next sentence states, Isaiah 59, that's all the verses, Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 18. So she's very specific on which verses to, to actually read. Amos 5, 11 to 20. Then Micah 6, 6 to 15. Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Hosea 6, 1 through 11. Then over to chapter 8 verses 12 and 13. Then jump into Joel chapter 1 verses 2 to 7 and 11 to 20. So she got very specific at those verses. Okay, so what do those verses mean? She continues to write. 
there we have the prophecies of the state of our world just prior to the second coming of the Lord thy God. And it is that sentence that perked me up to say, well, wait a second. They were that specific to tell me, to describe to me what is transpiring right before the second coming? This is more than earthquakes and disasters and diseases and war and famine and all that. This sounds interesting. I'm going to go check it out. And when I did, I found that, yes, it was truly, truly very interesting. But I'm not done reading. The world will become more and more under the sway of seducing spirits as they turn away from God and his righteous government. So seducing spirits are already here, have been here, but now are continuously turning it up as we near the second coming. In other words, the demons and Satan himself can anticipate that the second coming is so close that he is putting forth the last ditch effort to gain every soul to his side so that when it's time for the war of Armageddon, it would be 100% his side and zero for Jesus to come back to. Now we know that's not true because there's going to be 144,000 that do not bow the knee to Baal. But again, continuing on, men professing godliness will indulge in their own traits of character. As I stated, there are so many so-called godly people attending all these different denominations and then after the church service, they are embezzling. Uh, that's a type of stealing, of course. So I was going to say stealing. Uh, lying. Uh, the contracts that they break. Adultery. Uh, the disobedience to civil law. You know, we think it nothing to, uh, uh, to break any of the laws that man has made to, for our governance, uh, our safety. And of course, I'm not referring to the ungodly laws, but definitely the godly ones. Uh, they indulge in those things. How can you be on the side of God if that's what the case? Now, unless they are conscientiously under the control of God, they will become self-indulgent and self-centered. In other words, these are the people that say, I am in need of nothing. I am rich. The Laodicean church. So this whole paragraph, which I am now done, uh, done reading that is, definitely perks my interest. And I thought, well, let's present this. And what we're going to do today is simply read through all of those verses making a comment here or there so that it's not just a scripture reading. But I want to let you know that we are not going to dwell and investigate those verses because that's what's going to happen next Sabbath, starting with the very first verse, and we'll try and do it in sequence, but we'll start with Isaiah 59 and do a verse-by-verse -verse study because, well, she did say that. She said all of chapter 59 is applicable to right before the second coming. And what's interesting is that in the sermons that I've put together, there were a number of chapters from Isaiah that I have presented verse by verse in a series. And I have no idea how long this series is going to be then, by the way. Now, with that, that in mind, I'm just trying to tell you that if this particular chapter, Isaiah 59, is relevant to the second coming per Ellen White, then that behooves us to want to do a study to make sure we are on the right side of things, believing the right beliefs. We could do all the right things, but if we don't have that which is uh, to be believed and have faith in, we could be found on the wrong side. And I don't want anybody lost. That's why uh, these messages are being presented. Uh, so with that in mind, let's start off with our very first uh, search of the scriptures of Isaiah 59. And like I said, 
we will come back. And my point being about Isaiah is the fact that a lot of people, when you think of prophecy, automatically turn to Daniel and Revelation. There's a lot, a lot of other scriptures that pertain to the final events than just Daniel and Revelation. And we're going to expand upon that because, well, Ellen White has made a nice outline. That's all I can say, is that she made a nice outline, and we're going to go back and study these things. So in Isaiah 59, there are 21 fairly large paragraphs that, or verses that we're going to read. So it is uh, pretty lengthy, despite only being 21 verses long. Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lamb's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. So, pray to God. And don't ever believe that there's no hope for yourself. I love how that just started right off. Because in this dreadful time of year that we live in, these closing scenes are becoming nothing but a cesspool of sin. Verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Now, how can he hear, but yet not hear? If we choose to stay in our sins, he will not hear us. If you choose that you want to be taken out of sin, now notice I said want to, because we can't do it ourselves, he would then hear. But as long as we're enjoying the sin, he doesn't hear our prayers. Verse 3 says, For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with the iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Verse 4 says, None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity, and speak lies. They conceive mischief, and bring forth iniquity. And now that is really beginning to describe today's society. The people are not out for justice. Just look what's happening political-wise with all the lawsuits and things like that. It's not after justice. It's after iniquity. They hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their, their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out unto a viper. And... Um, and so, yeah, we're messing with uh, Satan's snares, basically. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the acts of violence is in their hands. Verse 7 says, Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their past. Now keep in mind, blood does not always mean actual murder and people bleeding. There's another way to inflict such uh, issues upon a person without the actual physical blood shed, and though it be in that category. Verse 8, the way of peace they know not. Aren't we being promised peace and safety? It's not of God. And there is no judgments in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not have uh, no peace. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for righteousness, but the they walk in darkness. And... Uh, so that's why it is dangerous to distance ourselves from the investigative judgment that's happening right now. They know, people that don't understand the, uh, the judgment since 1844 are in deep trouble. And that's what that is describing, the lack of knowledge thereof. Verse 10 says, We grope for the wall like the blind, because they're in darkness, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday, as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. And to give you a preview of what's coming in a future message, in other words, the next message, as we go verse by verse, 
uh, there is a difference between the children of darkness and the children of light. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as far as um, for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart uh, words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backwards, and justice standeth after off, uh, uh, afar off, I'm sorry, afar off, the truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yeah, truth is pretty much um, in danger today. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm uh, brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. And so what we have here happens to be um, the period of time that there is going to be no intercessor. And so we're going to get a lot more details of when that actually happens. Okay, so let's take a look at the next verse here in verse 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So this is the description of Jesus' ministry here. According to their deeds, according to he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to his uh, to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name uh, of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy shall. Uh, come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in my thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. There's a lot of detail there. And um, I really don't want to give too much away, but you can see that it's more than just simple earthquakes and things like that. At the same time, I want to keep your interest and not just be a reading thereof. And uh, hopefully I've interjected enough to pique your interest to continue with the messages as we move forward. Speaking of which, our next scripture reading, and we have uh, six more to go. It's fun, interesting um, that there's a total of seven scripture readings, and I'm not talking about different chapters. I'm talking about the by the same writers. Uh, let's go to Ezekiel 20 now. So Ezekiel chapter 20. I just like the number seven uh, since that's God's favorite uh, number as well. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 is where we're headed. Ezekiel 20. And let's take a look here at verses, again, just 12 and 18. Here in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, it says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. And jumping down to verse 18, But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. And so I don't, God doesn't want to hear the excuse, Well, my, my parents, uh, they were raised Catholic. Do you know how much idolatry is in the Catholic Church? Oh, and don't think uh, Protestants get off scot-free. Do you know how much idolatry has been carried into many of the Protestant denominations? Don't make the excuse when the subject of the Sabbath comes up and you say, well, 
my parents, they kept Sunday, and they're in the grave now. It was fine for them, and uh, I expect to see them in heaven. Well, you have more light than your parents or your grandparents. You need to make the decision now. You're the one that has more enlightenment, and God will hold you responsible for that. Okay, that's it for Ezekiel. Let's move over to Amos. Amos is where we're headed next. And uh, here in Amos, let's take a look here in Amos. We're going to look at chapter 5, verses 11 to 20. So, Amos, chapter 5, starting in verse 11. For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from his burdens of wheat, ye have built houses in hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink uh, wine of them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe. They turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Verse 13 says, Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil, love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas! And they shall call the husbandmen of mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentations to wailing. And all their vineyards shall be willing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord! So uh, to what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion and bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Do we see what's coming upon the earth the very days leading up to the second coming? I mean, the seven last plagues are going to be horrific. That doesn't mean we who are keeping the Sabbath honestly, keeping all the Ten Commandments, who are seeking the Lord honestly, cannot be looking forward to the second coming. We can look forward to it. But do take in mind that, as Ellen White also pens, that usually people exaggerate the event, especially an awful event, more than they really happen to be. And in this case, the events leading up to the Second Coming are worse than what has already been described. And I'll tell you this much, from what I've read from Ellen White's writings, they give me the shivers. They, and that is just a glimpse of what is coming. Now, thankfully, Jesus reminds me that we ought not to uh, be worried about those days coming. So uh, sufficient is today the evil thereof. And so do not, uh, be letting your anxiety get out of control. Okay, so that's the preview from Amos. Let's take a look at Micah. What does Micah have to add on to all of this? Let's take a look at that. Uh, Micah is where we're, we're headed next. In the book of Micah. Uh, let's see here. Micah. Book of Micah. Let's 
There we go. In the book of Micah, let's take a look here at verses, chapter 6, verses 6 to 15. So Micah 6, 6 to 15. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city of the man of wisdom, and will see thy name. Hear the rod, and who hath appointed it? Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances, and with the bag of deceitful weights? For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and our inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongues is uh, deceitful in their mouth. And you know, we talk about the people that are referred to as the elite, and uh, what we just read so far is definitely describing their greediness. Therefore also I will make thee sick in smitting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. And the, the, uh, thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. And thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil and sweet wine, but shall not drink wine. Hmm, that sounds familiar of what we already read from an, uh, another prophet. But uh, the food supply today, even when you try to buy organic, is it really fulfilling? Or do you go away hungry yet? You know, you eat and eat, eat, eat and you get bigger and bigger and bigger, but you don't seem to be as satisfied as once were. And that's no uh, conspiracy theory either. Uh, it's straight out there messing with the food. I mean, you, if you, that's why people try to buy organic is because of how they have messed around with the food. Uh, but we'll get more details at a at the later date. So now let's move over to Haggai. Haggai is next, and let's take a look here in Haggai. Um, let's see here. In Haggai, uh, let's take a look at chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe, uh, ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. And not all of that is physical, by the way. How much money do we spend on evangelism? Quite a bit. How many souls are one? Oh, we're baptizing 3,000. We're bragging 3,000 a day. Uh, we're, we're bringing in souls. R how many stick around? How many actually know the truth? How many know the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary? H how many know the details of uh, the 2,300-day prophecy? Uh, all of these things. And uh, how much jewelry and uh, um, inappropriate clothing do they wear? All of these things, and you find out that we have brought in nearly 3,000 souls to be, as Alan White describes, fodder for the fire. What a, what a shame. No wonder it says the vast majority of Seventh-day Adventists are going to be lost. In fact, worse than that, they're going to be our worst enemy. They're going to be brought in to testify 
look, this is a Seventh Day Adventist, uh, and they don't, they're not as picky as you are regarding the Sunday law. Yeah, exactly. All right. So from Haggai, let's go over to Hosea chapter 6 as well. Hosea chapter 6. And let's pick things up here in Hosea 6, taking a look at verses 1 through 11 here, and then we'll switch over to another chapter. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. You ever feel the correction of God? It's not just to correct us. It's to actually heal us. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as in the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And that is the moving of the Holy Spirit. And there is this thing called the loud cry. And that is described in Revelation 18 as the fourth angel that joins the three angels. Hence the name of our ministry, by the way. Preparing people for that time frame. Uh, we do not c declare ourselves to be that fourth angel. But uh, when the fourth angel is crying aloud, uh, which is the outpouring of the former and latter rain, uh, it's the any type of YouTube. Uh, these messages won't be there anymore. The publication will be ceased because uh, they will put restrictions on it. Eventually we're going to get to the point in which Ellen White describes that we will be going house to house with our Bibles. And that's what she foresees. And um, and that's even going to be r risky at the at the time as well. So we uh, continue uh, in chapter 6, in verse 4, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? Now remember, when she names names here, it's not always a literal city or place on this physical earth. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean she, as in Ellen White. I meant uh, uh, in reference from Ellen White too here, th these, when God spoke According to Paul, they wrote more for our time than for their time, but they experienced their time, hence they write in the terms of their time. But we'll find out what Ephraim and Judah, it says, oh Judah, and we'll find out what they mean when we get to them in details, because there is a meaning behind each of these names that are applicable, especially for us in this day. Shall I do unto thee, for your goodness is the as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. Therefore have I hewed the, them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And thy judgments are in light that goeth forth. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant, so anybody telling you that you're allowed to break the covenant, which is the Ten Commandments, think again. There have they dealt treacherously against me. <clears throat> so all the cam commandment keepers are going to be um, worked against, as it said there, treacherously. Um, Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. And now Gilead is not equal to Washington, D.C. And as the troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. I have, I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the whore, whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Hmm, a whore in Israel. Would that point to the Antichrist? Also, O Judah, he hath set in harvest for thee when I return the captivity of my people. And now go over to chapter 8. Let's take a look here at verses 12 and 13. The Bible says here in Hosea 8, verse 12, 
I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as strange things. So all the denominations that count the Ten Commandments as a strange thing is what's being described here. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins and shall return to Egypt. And so that's the description, once again, of today's Christian world. Finally, let's get to the book of Joel. And Joel is where we're headed next. Let's take a look there. And the book of Joel. So, Joel is next, and I bet you it's hiding between chapters here. Yep, there it is. All right. Joel chapter 1, verses 2 to 7. And then we'll have another set of verses. Joel chapter 1, verse 2. Hear this, ye old men. And give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. You know, we, by the way, we've been around here for, uh, as far as the 1844 message, I believe they say that it's like five generations. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. And if you would consider the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church being eaten away with liberalism, uh, that's a pretty good description thereof because it happens ever so step by step as it was described here. Each generation from the separation of 1844, even when I read Ellen White's writings, how she refers to those ministers that are coming on board now in her day, that is, do not understand and appreciate the truth as much as the earlier church founders did. And what they went through to get the truth out to the condition in which they were now going to the world with the, with the gospel message. It's more like a job to them. Uh, it's carelessly being handled. And that's back in her day. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye uh, drinkers of wine, because of the new wine. For it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. And let's jump down to verses 11 through 20, which will be the end of our, our message then or overview, that is, starting in verse 11. Be ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languishes. The pomegranate tree, and the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, how ye ministers of the altar, come lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. And all this happening, remember, when uh, false doctrines come into the church, we're supposed to be weeping between the porch and the altar over the matter. Not going, yeah, this is why I'm not part of the conference. No, that's not how we're supposed to be doing it. 
Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land unto the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And there's we've got the war of Armageddon going on. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods, the gardeners and lay desolate, the barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. It looks like we can't trust in anything. Nothing's gonna survive. And that's so true. Uh, how do the beasts ground? The herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness and of the flame with the burned all the trees, or hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And when Jesus comes back, it's with a temptuous fire, consuming fire. So that's the overview that we have from Ellen White, who says that these chapters, these prophets, these verses, all point to life near the second coming. And I think it would behoove us to actually study in more detail each of these things. I made hints at the potential interest in those verses and applications thereof. As I continue to study the details of these out and formulate uh, more and more to the series, and uh, again from here on out we'll be doing the PowerPoint presentation, not that I like relying upon that, it's just going to be easier because I can imagine that there's going to be a lot of Ellen White quotes that will be applicable to help us understand these things. But nonetheless, uh, that is the plan. And may we, in the meantime, personally want to study these things out because, as I said, otherwise we're just playing church. Uh, again, as a reminder, I had um, uh, put out a video on the millennium and it seems that everybody loved the millennium or hundreds of people had lo loved the millennium and um, that's because it doesn't deal with sin. It just kind of, you know, this is what leads up to the millennium. This is what the millennium experience is going to be. This is what happens after the millennium. There, we're done. Well, most of the, the messages that are in this ministry, it's to prepare people to stand in the last days. God doesn't really care if you got the millennium details all messed up. He wants to save your soul. And that's where I am interested in. And all such messages get nine views here, 16 there, 24 there. Nothing like the one on the millennium. I'm not searching for, for, for the numbers myself. What I'm interested is more of this is what you should expect from the ministry because those 24 or even 9 faithful people that tune in to see a character developing message, they're the ones that are in a better pathway towards the second coming as opposed to those that are always jumping from this and how does this piece of article news uh, apply to the uh, times that we live in Ooh, ah, and uh, I can anticipate the Sunday law over here and folks none of that matters if we're not spiritually ready and to think that we are spiritually ready while we're chasing all those things we're going to be fooled because we're basically fulfilling what the Laodicean church says that I am rich and increased in goods and I have need of nothing. Let us not fall into that category but humble ourselves and look forward to the instruction and be chastened of the Lord through his word. Let's think on those things and put things in right perspective. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very much for the time that you will gave us here to spend in thy word and we thank you for the overview that you have provided that we may think on these things and take the events coming up 
between now and the second coming very seriously. And I pray that you will continue to give us the insight, help us to develop those characters in a right manner, and be ready for that great and glorious day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.